Uh, it's great to see you all here. Yes, it's going to be hot. So, uh, you know, fans. Huh? Nice. Well, okay. I'll let you. Um, both. Excellent. Excellent. Um, one thing that's not in your announcements is we are having a Gideon representative here next week. Sunday. Uh, once a year we have a representative of the Gideons come and just kind of give an update of their ministry, six to eight minute kind of report. And then after the service they just have an open Bible and, and they receive whatever offering any of you want to give. It's very low stress, but it's something that we love to be able to support. Anytime we can get the word of God into the hands of people so that the Lord might do his work in their hearts and lives, we're supportive of that. So we're uh, I'm not sure who the representative is. Well, it probably will be. But they, uh, they never told me until like right before. So, it'll probably... Oh! It is. It is? It is? It is Bill and Carol. Okay, excellent. Okay. Well, we always love having Bill and Carol. So, yes, okay. Excellent. So, they will be here then next Sunday. Um, and, and so, it'll be wonderful to hear again how the Lord is using their ministry. Also, um, this Saturday uh, is supposed to be men's breakfast. But um, we're going to have to... We're going to postpone, not postpone, uh, no men's breakfast this month. There will be next month, but Pastor Don will normally fill in for me. Um, and so we're both going to be gone because football season starts this uh, Wednesday. So, uh, so yeah, but it'll, men's breakfast will continue on September as well. Um, but I have something to you that oh, okay. I want to think use that text that you sent me. Can I mention that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, Pastor John and I were just texting this week, and I don't know how many of you follow closely. Pastor John tends to follow Whitworth College over in Spokane uh, closer than I did because Anna Grace went there. So, they just came out with the news that it's a, you know, supposed to be a Christian college that now they will hire uh, openly LGBTQ, et cetera, for faculty member, and there was something else tagged on with it. That was um, the key thing. That was the key thing. So again, uh, shocking, I don't think I'm shocked by it, but saddened slash surprised would be a, kind of another domino falling. And so uh, I just wanted to read just one section of scripture, no sermon here. But 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to the deceitful spirit and teaching their demons through the insecurity of lies whose conscience are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created you to receive with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Now, I know that it doesn't explicitly say LGBTQ, the homosexuality issue, but the issue here says, and if you read Timothy and, and 2 Timothy, that people who are claiming to be Christians will fall away from the faith. Now, they don't think they're falling away from the faith. But just so we're all clear, because I've started teaching the word apostasy to my kids at the dinner table. Um, an apostasy is when you turn away from a clear-cut teaching in Scripture and you're just saying, we're not doing that. That is a form of apostasy. You can't be a believer and do that. Now, there are things that we all can agree on that are open-handed issues, that are in-house issues that we've talked about before the Calvinism, Arminian debate, all that stuff. But when you start openly defying scripture that is really clear and you try to twist it, you are no longer a believer. Like, you're apostate. You can get things really wrong at first, but somebody like Whitworth that has just come out and said, hey, we're doing this, those people are apostate. And so, I just want to mention that as one of the shepherds here that we're not going there. Like, so we're not going there, and it's appropriate for us as the shepherds, Pastor John and I, to address this openly with the church. And the key is, 
We don't get to decide what the Word of God says. It's not like optional, right? It's not like Jack Sparrow said, where it's like they're guidelines. They're not, they're not guidelines. They're, this is what the Word of God is. So I just felt like, as I was praying about the church this week after Pastor John said that, that again, I don't want to, for non-believers, I'm very, hey, we love you, let us teach you. But people who come out and say, hey, we're following Jesus, but then they just totally try to peddle the word of God that says something that it doesn't say. I, I don't have a lot of patience for them, right? It's the whole rebuke the goats, tend the sheep, and shoot the wolves deal. Those people are not representing Jesus. Maybe there are some over there that are, but that is a like faculty or whatever entity is not. So, anyways. How do you say the word? Apostasy. Apostasy? Yep. Or apostate. And it means, be apostate. Leave, it means leaving the word of God? Well, it would mean to turn it, depart from the faith. Depart from the faith. Say it again? It would mean to depart from the faith. Thank you. And what we would interpret that is, right, because Whitworth is, if we said, hey, you guys are apostate, they would say, no, we're not. We still believe Jesus is the only way, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, but you're picking and choosing the commandments that Jesus has laid down in his word. You don't get to say that you're led by the Spirit of God and then contradict the Word of God which the Spirit has inspired. The Scriptures are not an a la carte minion. No, they're not. So. Right, and, so, and there's a difference between the things that are less clear in the Scriptures and that, yes. and that believers can disagree on and, and, and both adhere to the authority of the Word and learn to love one another, and then there are those things that are just blatantly obvious and core to the very system of the faith that those are the things we're talking about. When you start messing with the core of the faith, then you can't really in genuine integrity claim the faith. And those those who do, we we need to call out and warn against. And that's that is a dominant movement in our culture and world today to basically embrace that whole movement that eviscerates the entire ethical system of the faith in the scriptures throughout it from Old Testament to New. Yeah. And you can't eviscerate the ethics of scripture and still claim to have the, the at that point it's just a shell with nothing inside. Right. Yes, Frank? I would like to tag right on to the end of, of um, Sean's statements. Sure. Uh, we were uh, with the Presbyterian uh, Church in Oakwood for about 20 years, plus or minus, uh, and th they were BC USA, Presbyterian Church USA, and uh, I think they followed the word quite closely, but at, at, while we were there, the um, Okay, the, the description uh, of, of the Presbyterian Church was local church, a Presbyterian Synod of uh, General Assembly. General Assembly is the head of the church of, of, of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Well, the General Assembly went, uh, shall we say, gay in general. Uh, and eventually we said, okay, well, we're going to be looking. We went to a Presbyterian church, but our, our retired, we came up here. Um, evangelical Presbyterian, which were not gay. And, and basically that was mostly over the course of my work in life. So, I mean, it hasn't been um, suddenly. Right. Uh, it's been coming. Uh, it has. It has we been. Need yes. To stand up for the word of God. Yes. It it has been coming for for decades now. Um, it's just that you know. So there, everything, whether for godliness or for wickedness, you lay the groundwork and, and until you're ready to build the edifice. And and we've probably been too complacent and um, too quiet. Um, but the time to stand and be faithful is very clear right now. And there is there is no wiggle room. There is no middle ground. Um, so we got two hands. Was it JP and then Michael? 
So the point has already been made. These dominoes started falling probably shortly after R.B. Wade respectfully submitted these pillars in our society. And uh, Whitman, for example, has they held out for a while and then come. And there are going to be other pillars, great pillars, tumble in the future. My point is just as simple. The more the pillars that, that tumble, the odder we are going to see. We might as well come to grips with the fact that we have been called and set apart. And there will be a price to pay for that. Right. And it could be friendships, it could be relationships, it could be any number of different things. But the point is, the weirder society gets, they remember, they think they're normal. Right. The weirder we are going to appear. This is what we are called to do. So, stay in order and do your job. <laughs> Mike, I don't want to extend this out a whole bunch more, but uh, I just wanted to uh, just add to that that we all acknowledge that we are saved by faith alone, yeah. not by works. Right. But faith and obedience cannot be separated. That true faith is a faith that obeys. Yeah. And Jesus, Jesus, the word we have from Jesus is, those who love me are those that keep my commands. Yes. And they are the ones to whom I will reveal myself. Yes. And that's what he says. And so while we are saved by faith alone, and many of places like Whitworth and stuff like that, they'll say, oh, we're saved by faith alone. And they'll use that as an excuse not to obey. Right. And but faith and obedience cannot be separated. Correct. They are inseparable. Correct. If you truly believe, you, it, like Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right? Yes. Sam? Um, I don't know if it's proper for a woman to speak right now, but um, these people have an agenda to take over America. The Marxists, they're following the Marxist playbook. They want to destroy. They're in every 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 corner now, and they're infiltrating. They want to destroy the family, the church, children. That's their that's their agenda, and we need to educate ourselves more on where they're coming from. Uh, I think that's important too to know what their mindset is. Yeah, to help us to be able to speak to the culture in love and not anger because they're looking for opportunities for you yeah. to get anger oh, sure. and then they're going to capitalize on yeah. that yeah. because every institution in our country is behind that. So I want to, sh this is going to pick up on JP and also what you guys are sharing too. So this, what we're entering into, I like think in, in force is actually not new. Right. So the earliest Christians, 1 Peter chapter 4, um, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. The time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in, now, so you can just fill in the blank, it's the same stuff, just we label it sometimes differently. Uh, what the Gentiles want to do, living in, sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, for this is why the gospel is preached, etc., etc. Um, but there it is. Um, we're entering into what seems to us uncharted territory, but it's not uncharted for the gospel. And the gospel was able to penetrate that Roman world then. It can penetrate, you know, barring the judgment of God that is deserved, it can penetrate the, the, the West uh, that has so lost its way even today. So do not lose heart. Give yourself to the will of God. Be ever present with the gospel in word and life and, and stand faithful to God first of all. Yes, Kathy. Light always dispels darkness. Yes, yes. Always. So that was our sermon for today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just kidding. Just kidding. We're still in the announcements. It's not in the And what happened yeah. in Nazi Germany and the church is there. And that is another good example. 
of how of what happened. In, I mean, it, within the German church that would allow the Nazism to take hold, and you had just a, a small remnant of dissenters. The Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a part of yes, Carol. Correct. Correct. Bingo. 
I, we're, we're all sinners. I say to other people, I'm a sinner too. Yes. I refuse to celebrate your yes. sin. Yes. And that's what they're asking us to do. Yes. Oh. It's just what's prevalent in society too right now. Like, right. If it was like a while ago, you know, big huge food movement, you know what I mean? It, gluttony can be lumped in that category as well. It's yes. just what society is present in society in our challenge right now. It's, it's not, it's guys, I, I, I understand what you're saying. It's not the same thing. The reason that it's so bad, and if you read Romans 1, is because it's so clear that a man and a woman's body are made to go together. When society comes out and says, we don't care what that's made for, we're doing it this way, that's what God is talking about in Romans 1 when he gives their mind over to it. I'm not saying that all sins aren't sinful, but what we're recognizing here, and I think we can move on here soon, is that now, now, now that the, the people, that, and this is the issue, that people that are claiming the name of Jesus and have institutions that are colleges that are claiming the name of Jesus are saying, this is God ordained, that's Romans 1 to me. And my point is, as one of the shepherds here is, you better buckle up. Right. Like so, it's not, in my opinion, unless there is a, 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 a Holy Spirit revival, it's not gonna get better. It, it has, and love you, Sandy. It doesn't have anything to do with Marxism. Marxism might be a part of it, but it's all spiritual. And so you're gonna have to be able to gird up your loins of your mind and stand on the word of God. And just, I, I have this conversation with my friend. Why is it so bad? I go, because God didn't design it this way. And now you're saying that this design of this way, and it's so clear that it's not. And so the point is, is that we have to be ready, and you don't get to pick and choose things out of Scripture. When you do that, you open the door. That is how he gets in. Right. And so, like, just be ready. Yeah. Right? And don't give an inch. If it's true, it's true. We don't need to apologize to it. And I like with Whitworth, I'm not gonna go, well, we're all the same. No, you're apostate. You are a wolf. You don't have anything to do with the body of Christ. You are a servant of Satan. And 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 you can repent and come back, but you are not a part of the holy bride of Christ. No way. No way. Alright, any questions? No. Sounds like we no. have more meetings before we have discussion. Adult Sunday School. Yeah, we're Adult Sunday School. We do this all the time. This is actually a lot like what Adult Sunday School is, by the way. We start on September 10th. September 10th. So, um, Brian or one of the deacons, did you guys want to say something about the work party on Saturday? Let's have a work party on Saturday. <laughs> 10 o'clock on Saturday. Um, we'd love to serve lunch after that, but we need a little help to bring some food together to do that. So lots of different things just to try to wrap up some of the, the uh, great encouraging things that we've been able to accomplish at the, at the parish house. And we appreciate your help to do that. Is there going to be insulation work? Oh, there's a little bit of insulation. Yeah, don't don't wear good. shorts necessarily. Don't wear shorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, well, just saying. I've heard bad things happen in that time. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's it. And we have a couple of birthdays this week. So I know we already sang for the Harris and the Woods last yeah. week, right, for your anniversary. But Kathy has a birthday this week, right? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And Stephanie, oh, and you have one too? Oh, my little has one. It was Friday. Oh, it was Friday? I think we should sing. Yeah. And then Stephanie, where does she could skate out? She skated out. She's outside. But can she hear us if we sing her? Oh, she laughing. Excellent. You have a birthday, right? According to my cheat sheet. Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So let's let us sing. A happy birthday to Michael and Kathy and Stephanie. Happy birthday to you.
worship with prayer. Please stand for a call to worship from Psalm 56. <laughs> Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crimes will they escape, and in wrath cast down the peoples of God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in Yahweh, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Please turn in your uh, worship guide. There should be an insert for you with a couple of bluegrass gospel songs. Let us sing them together.
feel um, that's, that darkness and that weight upon us as we um, traverse through this valley. Um, and we do find ourselves struggling with the uncertainties and the fears of the unknown and, and of the known. Um, and so we know we need you. We need you to come close to us, to, to not only walk beside us, but to guide us and to uphold us with your righteous right hand, as you say you do. To fear not, because you are with us and you are not weak. And you are not tame. Right? So we come to you, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on us, that we might walk forward in a way that is pleasing to you this day and each new day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another in the Lord. Today's message um, we're reading from the Bible is uh, Matthew chapter 10, 26 through 33. Excuse me, I got it. Sobering word, but good for reorientation. If I could call the kids forward, that we're going to sing a song that comes directly out of um, Psalm 56, verse 3, that we use for a call to worship. So once you're done with this song, you will have memorized another Bible verse, and it's a good one. When I am afraid, I will trust you. No, I don't have any hand motions. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God. But it's really good, yes. right? Kids, you got all those words down? Yes. I, I'm, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you. That's pretty easy, right? All right, let's do it one more time. Yes. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God.
time of prayer together. We have much that uh, we can bring before the Lord, do we not? And Heavenly Father, I do want to pray for the devastation over on Maui and Hawaii right now as the numbers increase uh, with the devastating of deaths and the devastating fire there, and not just the deaths, but the destruction of, of property and whole towns, Lord. Um, we, we, we don't understand why you bring these things into our lives and for what your purpose might be. But I would pray that um, you would pour out your mercy even in the devastation, that you would awaken your church there on Maui especially to just uh, step forward boldly into the devastation to minister your mercy and your peace and your comfort in this time, Lord. May your name be honored and glorified even through the fires in Jesus' name. We, uh, we pray for our friend Robin, who's uh, been admitted to the hospital again, and uh, let them find out what is uh, the cause of his illness. Lord. Be with Jean and Judy Nelson as they travel back to Washington State for a couple weeks. We'll be blessed with their presence. and thanksgiving to you for your goodness and your mercy and your love and your patience, all your perfect attributes, Lord. 
including your justice and your wrath, they all make up who you are, Lord. And we not always understand those things, but Lord, you've been patient with all of us. You say in your word, the wages of sin is death. That means the moment we are conceived, we are all under the sentence of death. But by your mercy and your grace, you let us live on borrowed time, giving us patience long suffering, you give us a chance to repent and, and believe in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of the devastation over on Maui and, and really lots of places in America and around the world, Lord, that those would be times where people would open their hearts and see their needs. Are they ready? Are they ready to meet you? Right. And I would say that would be true with all of us, Lord. Uh, I think of Luke chapter 13, uh, when you're talking about um, the tower that fell on the innocent people there that were worshiping, and it seemed like they were doing a really wonderful thing. But your response is, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So I pray that, Lord, the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of where we stand before you, holy God, would penetrate the hearts of people that are involved in these situations and realize that it was you, if they survived, that spared their life, Lord. And I just pray for them that many of them will come to a saving faith and knowledge of you, Lord. And I thank you for the discussions we had this morning, Lord. We live in such difficult times, Lord. I pray that you would give us wisdom, and I pray for those that are caught up in these horrible, evil things, and they are evil, Lord, they're from the pit of hell. I pray, Lord, for those people, Lord, that I pray for their deliverance. I pray for their repentance. I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom on how to respond and how to uh, take a stand for you, Lord, and have courage. We need your courage, Lord. On our own, we won't be able to do it. We need you every step of the way. And I pray, Lord, you would be with Pastor John as he preaches and proclaims your word to us today, Lord, that it would strengthen us and encourage us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your kindness. And I ask these things come before you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Father, we also know that there are some that were not able to join us this morning. We do lift up those that were not able to fellowship this morning, Father God. We just pray that you pull them in tight, Father God, that you uh, heal what hurts and uh, help them get done what needs to do in Father God. I know that the missing church is uh, never anybody's idea of a good thing, Father God. But sometimes, sometimes life gets complicated for God. And I would just ask that you be with these dear ones as they are missing fellowship with us this morning. Please, Lord, help us to identify our own sin. Yes. Yeah, please help us to root it out of our hearts. Forgive us for these sins. Please help us to overcome them. Then let us voice together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If I could call forward the ushers at this time to receive the offering.
Please turn in your scriptures now to Jeremiah chapter 38. We'll be looking at 38 verse 7 through the end of chapter 39. When Abimelech the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern, the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Abimelech went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Then the king commanded Abimelech the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you from here, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Abimelech took the men with him and went to the house, the house of the king, to a wardrobe in the storehouse, and took from there old rags and worn out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. Then Abimelech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of Yahweh. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you counsel, you will not listen to me. Then King Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, as Yahweh lives, who made our souls, I will not put you to death or deliver you into the hand of these men who seek your life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says Yahweh, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest I be handed over to them, and they deal cruelly with me. Jeremiah said, You shall not be given to them. Obey now the voice of Yahweh in what I say to you, and it shall be well with you, and your life shall be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which Yahweh has shown to me. Behold, all the women left in the house of the king of Judah were being led out to the officials of the king of Babylon and were saying, Your trusted friends have deceived you and prevailed against you. Now that your feet are sunk in the mud, they turn away from you. All your wives and your sons shall be led out to the Chaldeans, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and this city shall be burned with fire. And Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. If the officials hear that I have spoken with you, and come to you, and say to you, Tell us what you said to the king, and what the king said to you. Hide nothing from us, and we will not put you to death. Then you shall say to them, I made a humble plea to the king that he would not send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and asked him, and he answered them as the king had instructed him. So they stopped speaking with him, for the conversation had not been overheard. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard until the day that Jerusalem was taken. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate. Nergal Sarizer of Samgar, Nebuzar Sikim the Rab Saris, Nergal Sarizer the Rab Mag, and all the rest of the officers of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, they fled 
going out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls, and they went toward the Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on them, on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes, and the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him, and the people who remained. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him. Look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. So Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, the Rabsaras, Nebuchadnezzar, the Rabmag, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon, sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. They entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. The word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares Yahweh, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares Yahweh. So the way I've divided this current section, chapters 37 to 39, right? I told you how I wrestled with how to break it up last time, because 37, 38, and 39 are all one. But the way I've divided up this current section highlights the faith of a foreign slave in contrast to the dominating fear of the native king. It opens with his courageous request and action and closes with the Lord's commendation, essentially, well done. If I can borrow once again from the parable in Matthew 25 that I referenced last week, Matthew 25, 21, and 23, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's what we should be living for. And that's what this named, but really unnamed, individual receives. Because Ebed Melech just means servant or slave of the king. So it's not really a name, and yet it's his put in his place, kept in his place moniker which God now, as he closes out this section, elevates above all others. And why? God says, because he trusted in me. 39, verse 18. Ah. And that, in the face of daunting fears, the Babylonian army was about to breach the city and slaughter, or forcibly deport, Every last man, woman, and child, with the exception of the landless and poor detritus. And in the interim, all the people with power in this doomed city are hell-bent on crushing any expression of dissent or genuine faith. Oh, that's starting to sound familiar now, isn't it? <laughs> and yet above all this, the Lord declares that he trusts in me. Above all that? And what are our daunting fears? Say, the threat of a full-fledged military apocalypse if we are somehow drawn into war with China, along with Russia, North Korea, Iran. The complete undermining of the new generation's thinking. A wholesale change of worldview to embrace the sex and gender, etc. ideology that has become so ascendant in our land. 
and where faith and dissent are actively squelched. The rapid decline uh, in the priority of faith or in the very presence of faith itself in our younger generations especially, coupled with the rapid rise in nihilism and despair, along with the disillusionment with the stabilizing institutions in our land whose trust has been repeatedly undercut by corruption, all propelling us toward a generalized fear of what the future holds. But this half section, and especially the dichotomy between the figures of the king, Zedekiah, and the slave of the king, Evan Miller, really highlights the question of which force will be our driving force which force will govern our lives, our decisions, our actions? Will it be fear or will it be faith? Right? So first, will it be fear? And here I want to hone in on Zedekiah's fear as exhibited here, for he is a premier example of one whose governing force was not faith, though he claimed it. Right? Notice chapter 38, 16, if you have your Bibles open, where Zedekiah swears, as Yahweh lives, who made our souls, right? Just like he had recently asked Jeremiah in chapter 37, verse 3, please pray for us to Yahweh, our God. He is a premier example of one whose governing force was not faith, but fear. And fear of three particulars that we find before us here. One is the fear of the Babylonians, certainly also known as the Chaldeans, which is the ethnic background of those currently reigning over Babylon. And he had every good reason to be afraid because he had been first placed on the throne of Judah as a Babylonian vassal by this very king Nebuchadnezzar. And yet he chose to rebel against his overlord and ally himself with Egypt instead, probably uh, with the promise of a lesser tribute which would mean keeping more money in their own pockets, which is always, you know, one of those good motivators, right? But overlords, including especially ancient Near Eastern overlords, never take too kindly to rebellion or being betrayed. And so they are coming after him with a vengeance. Okay, two, fear of the Judean deserters. Explicitly, he says, chapter 38, verse 19, I am afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest I be handed over to them and they deal cruelly with me. I mean, he has a genuine and justified fear of his own people who'd already des deserted, including his own soldiers. If you recall from up in verse 4, we looked at last week how, how the officials complained about Jeremiah stoking the timidity of the soldiers who are left to the deserters, Zedekiah basically is responsible for ruining their lives. And they'd love to have a chance to really ruin his as well. Three, fear even of his own closest and highest officials. We see this fear expressed both at the beginning and at the end of chapter 38. Going back to about last week again, when his officials want to put Jeremiah to death, Zedekiah repli replies in verse 5, <coughs> Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. I mean, he doesn't have the personal backbone or the political will to stand against the combined force of his top officials. To do so at this juncture wouldn't just be political suicide, it might just be plain suicide. And at the end of the chapter, you can see how leery he is and how precarious his position is with him when Zedekiah closes out. He is once more one-on-one -on -one with this. Look at verses 24 and 25. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, let, them, let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. If the officials hear that I have spoken with you and come to you and say to you, tell us what you said to the king and what the king said to you, I have nothing from us, and we will not put you to death. And you'll notice... Not just here, but throughout the chapter, 
that is always the threat of death for Jeremiah, but underlying it here in this particular instance, in the verses there at the close of that chapter, it's perhaps intimated as well that there might be a threat of death to Zedekiah if he were to step outside the allotted lines. Okay, so Zedekiah's got these three dominant fears. But do you see what all of them have in common? It's the fear of man mm -hmm. rather than the fear of God. Mm -hmm. That is, he feared all these things rather than or more than God. And that caused him to ultimately, practically disregard God. Because even though he sought God out, the step removed via proxy, he didn't really want to hear or heed what God's been repeatedly saying. He wants the voice of God, but he wants it to change, to suit what he needs and what he wants. The problem is God doesn't change his word to suit our wants and needs, at least as we understand them, which are often off base. He gives his word as a gift for us to receive as is. And his word, once again, to Zedekiah here through Jeremiah was indeed a gift. He said, look at verses 17 and 18. If you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hands of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. The gift is this clarion word. Right? Spelled out ever so clearly in black and white in that double if then. But would he listen? which Jeremiah knew he wouldn't do, right? And why? Because he never did. Jeremiah said, verse 15, if I give you counsel, you will not listen to me. That's the critical thing right there. Stripping away all the form, right? And getting down to the substance, which harks back to chapter 37, verse 2, the summary of the whole reign of Zedekiah and of Jeremiah's whole experience with him, it says, but neither he, that is Zedekiah, nor his servants, nor the people of the land listened to the words of Yahweh that he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. Why would things change now, which he knows they won't, even as he continues to hold out hope? And as we see directly after that if-then gift extended, Zedekiah immediately responds with a dominant fear, and it's not the fear of God that would cause him to heed his word. He says, I am afraid, verse 19. His, a reaction to that gift is, I am afraid of the Judeans who have deserved to the Chaldeans. He's obsessed with and possessed by these dominant fears. And even though Jeremiah issues the stark alternatives once again right after that, verses 20 to 23, he can't see past his fears. His eyes never rise above them. But what he and we should truly fear is God, right? The fear that is faith. And thus heed his word above all other fear. Again, he feared all these things rather than or more than God, and that caused him not only to disregard God, but also to suffer the most horrific of judgments. Going back to that first if-then in verse 17, I talked about this word as a gift, and the first if-then is a remarkable gift. Should he receive it, 
He would spare not just his own life, but the lives of all those in the city, even the city itself. It shall not be burned with fire, God says. And he would spare his own sons. It says in verse 17 that you and your house shall live. That's him along with everyone in his household, including his male heirs. That's incredible. That's an incredible message of mercy and grace if he would but receive it, if he would but place his faith in God, fear of God over his fear of man. But he couldn't see past his own fears to the promises of God that we must receive by faith. You see, those sons... He would have spared by surrendering in that 11th hour. They were all slaughtered before his eyes, right before his eyes were plucked out. Look at verse, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 39. The king of Babylon. And this is ever so much more poignant if you read this right after verse 17. That gift that got offered. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes, and the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The last thing Zedekiah saw was the consequence of his faithlessness. The last thing Zedekiah saw was the cutting off of his hopes, and his dynasty. The last thing Zedekiah saw was the last thing any father would ever want to see, and that is the death of his own children. What a gruesome and horrible and utterly unnecessary end. If he had but listened, if he had but received the gift, but his fear of man was predominant over any fear of God. His fears eclipsed any semblance of true faith. Which is why God's verdict on this man wasn't good. It was evil. Now we probably feel some natural sympathy for him. And for his vacillating faith and lack thereof. And might even think that, okay sure he's not a model to follow. But you know he's in the faith. But God declares otherwise. In the summary evaluation we find in 2 Kings 24, verse 19, God says this. He did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. Short and clear and sobering for us all as well, especially seeing how well he represents so much of the American Church wanting that connection with God, but not willing to actually listen and thus obey, as that's what's inherent in the Hebrew word. The word for listen, Shema, for example, chapter 38, verse 15, where he says, You will not listen to me, is the same word, translates the same word translated as obey in verse 20 in my and most versions depending on the nuance of the context, because in the Hebrew mind, and rightly, to truly listen is to obey, especially if you're listening to God. And that's what Zedekiah lacked, and what marked him out as not belonging to God, as not doing right, but doing evil. It's his failure, his refusal to listen to, to hear and to heed the word of God. Where are you on that? And by the way, this fall of Jerusalem and the repeatedly threatened and then enacted burning of the city is a grim picture of the final judgment. When our Lord comes to judge both the living and the dead and to consign us to eternal blessedness or damnation. And one of the notable and chief descriptors of this damnation in the scriptures is the image of a horrid and unquenchable fire. What one views with horror here, one ought to view with even greater 
horror, the prospect of this personally, or for anyone we might know or love, and to plead with them with the word of grace that they do not spurn it, but receive it. And so receive life and salvation and escape, as we see it here for Jeremiah and Abimelech, rather than the horrors received by Zedekiah, all because he would not listen to the clear word of God, the word that comes to us as a gift, both in its warnings and also in its offer of salvation. Please do not ignore or dismiss the salvation that he offers for you. For example, in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And again in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This gift is for you. Receive the gift. So let me ask, I must ask, who or what do you fear most? Who or what will govern your life or let me ask it another way, picking up from Zedekiah and applying it to each of our lives. What are you afraid of more that would cause you to not listen to right, or follow God? Right here in his word. What are you afraid of more that would cause you not to listen to God? Is it the approval of your peers? Or the applause of culture? Is it getting ahead in life and the avoidance of any kind of hardship or suffering? Is it the fear of losing something or someone precious, even of losing that relationship that paralyzes you from trusting Him first? But as Ma Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 28, we heard it earlier do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's Jesus, by the way. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But mm -hmm. The gift is both the warning of judgment and the offer of salvation to hear the one and run to the other, right? But the force that drives and governs your life, your day-to-day thoughts and decisions and actions? Will it be the fear of man, what they think of you and what they might do to you? Or will it be the fear of God, what he thinks of you and wants for you? Will it be the fear of man, whose jurisdiction and punishments end here? Or will it be the fear of God, whose jurisdiction and punishments exist into the hereafter? This is the question lodged before us. How will you answer? Second, will it be faith? Going back to the opening question, which is the disposition that governs your life? Is it fear or is it faith? And now we're looking at faith. And we have two clear examples of that embodied for us here. Jeremiah, I mean, he's the constant and the given and especially, remarkably, Evan Miller. But let's first look at Jeremiah's faith and how his faith in God was the dominating force in his life. We've seen it really throughout the book, page after page, but here at the end we find it shining forth like a lamp in the darkness. Because here we find it standing resolutely faithful, picking up from the end of last week, even to death, even to being stuck, sinking in the muck at the bottom of a waterless cistern, cold and completely dark, without any food or water. And then we find him before the king once again. And even after that horrid experience, do we find him changing his tune? No. It's the same faithful word. He doesn't change or compromise even here. 
There is, however, one question that gets raised at the close of chapter 38. Uh, and I want you to turn there. It's when the king tells him, picking up verse 25, if the officials hear that I have spoken with you and come to you and say to you, tell us what you said to the king and what the king said to you, hide nothing from us and we will not put you to death, then you shall say to them, I made a humble plea to the king that he would not send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and asked him, and he answered them as the king had instructed him. Did Jeremiah just lie to save his neck? That seems out of place, given what we just walked through. Or is it just enough of the truth that it makes a plausible and acceptable cover story? And they don't deserve and shouldn't receive anything more than that. I'm reminded of when Samuel was God's voice to rebuke and declaratively remove King Saul. And when the Lord told him to go to Bethlehem to anoint Saul's successor, the Lord himself gave Samuel a partial truth slash plausible cover story. I just want to read it for you so that you guys see it for yourselves for Samuel 16. Yahweh said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hears it? He will kill me. And Yahweh said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what Yahweh commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So there, I'll let you all wrestle with that. But Jeremiah is an example of faith and faithfulness, and God honors that faith and that faithfulness. 1 Samuel 2.30, those who honor me, I will honor. And he does so by delivering him. Huh? Yeah. Now notice, okay, it's a little nuanced. He doesn't deliver him from suffering. Right? And suffering for his faithfulness to him and to his word. And he doesn't promise deliverance from suffering ourselves as we are faithful to him and to his word. I mean, you might escape suffering if you turn faithless. You'll avoid the suffering that comes from the world. But is that really the choice you want to make and the place you want to stand? Too many have done so already and are doing so at an alarming rate. We talked about Whitworth University from where my daughter Annie just graduated. Now officially changing its policy to begin hiring LGBTQ faculty. And I'm, I asked Annie about it and, and I said, you know, this really is kind of a linchpin moment for them. And then she asked me what a linchpin was. Uh, but I knew it was looming on the horizon. I just didn't realize that they would cage so quickly. I thought it would be five years, maybe ten at the most, and it happened now. But remember, brothers and sisters, the ultimate tribunal before which we all must stand. Romans 14, 10 and 12. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of God each of us will give an account of himself before God. You can avoid suffering now if you compromise to fit in with the world and to receive its applause. But what will you say when you stand before your Lord? And what will he say to you? But going back to how God delivers him, for one, he protects him from the ever- present threat of death. And you'll notice how many times that specter of death 
hangs over him in this section especially. Evan Melech, verse 9, blurts out that Jeremiah will die there in that pit of hunger. And the king recognizes the same dire state. He says in verse 10 to take him out of there before he dies, right? Jeremiah says to Zedekiah in verse 15, if I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? And Zedekiah replies, verse 16, I will not put you to death and deliver you into the hands of these men who seek your life. And after that conversation, Zedekiah counsels, verse 24, and let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. In other words, that you will die if you do. And he knows that they'll offer him his life in exchange for this coveted bit of info. You know, verse 25, we will not put you to death. And that he should drop that little tidbit about not being sent back to the dungeon to die there instead. That's verse 26. But he was in danger of death from his conditions, from his king, and from his own countrymen. But God had assured him all the way back at the beginning that he would deliver him. Jeremiah 119, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares Yahweh, to deliver you. And he did, even here. He kept his word. He always does. And for another, he delivers him from that awful execution pit through the agency of Evan Melech, which we'll look at in a moment. They actually intended a long, slow, traumatic, agonizing, and out of the way death. And what Jeremiah was doing down there in the darkness and the cold, sinking in the muck, no food or water or hope of escape, it doesn't say. And he mustn't have been there for too long before God rescued him, again from an unexpected angle. But I'm sure there was some very real and frank conversation with God like we saw in chapter 20. Go back there, it isn't pretty, but it's real. But he didn't change his tomb or betray his God. And again, he delivers him to more humane prison conditions. Over and over, three times, actually, we hear the exact same repeat of this phrase, quote, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard, unquote. We read it at the end of chapter 37, verse 21, where he's raised from the dungeon to this better place. Second time in chapter 38, verse 13, where he's raised from the pit to that better place. And lastly, at the end of chapter 38, verse 28, that's where he was kept. And in fact, that's exactly where the Babylonians find him after they breach the city. It was God's, you might say, God's own interesting way of keeping Jeremiah safe during the fall and destruction of the city. Because being in prison, they would know he's on the outs with the people in power. And I'm sure they're quickly able to identify him as the one who's been encouraging surrender. All the Judean defectors, I'm sure, spilled the beans on that. And then lastly, God delivers him to freedom. Chapter 39, verse 11 and following, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal, deal with him as he tells you. So Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, the son of Rabsaris, Nergos, well, these are great names for kids and grandkids, right? <laughs> Nergos, sorry, he's in this. Hey. The rabbi, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. They entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan. And we'll see that guy shortly, so we won't take the time to do that now. But there's something there that we'll, we'll need to touch on. That he should take him home so he lived among the people. As I quoted earlier, 1 Samuel 2, verse 30. Those who honor me, I will honor. But then that verse continues. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. We see that truism example clearly in the contrast between Jeremiah and his king. But now I want to look at Evan Melech's faith. Because his faithfulness and God's reward are what frame this subsection. I want us to look at who he is what he does, and how God rewards him. So first, he, uh, who he is. He is um, introduced out of the blue, right? We've never met this fellow before. He's introduced 
out of the blue for us in chapter 38, verse 7, when it says, Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, and each of those descriptors is heavily weighted. Because Ebed-Melech, as I mentioned at the beginning, isn't really a name. Even though it is, it's a slave name. It means servant or slave of the king. And he serves in the king's house. So he's one of Zedekiah's house servants, so close to him, at least in constant close proximity to him, and thus he's able to bend his ear as he does. Look at verses 8 and 9. And Melech went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Chapter 37 had ended with Zedekiah giving Jeremiah a loaf of bread a day in the court of the guard, it says, chapter 37, 21, until all the bread of the city was gone. Now, evidently, all the bread is gone, or at least seemingly so to the slave. And, it says, he's an Ethiopian, a Cushite in the Hebrew, which refers to the people south of Egypt inhabiting what are now the countries of Ethiopia and Sudan. So he's a black slave in the king's house. That means he's also a foreign convert who actually has faith in God. He trusts in me, God declares at the end of chapter 39, in contrast to the Judean king. Let me rephrase it. In contrast to the head of God's church back then. Who doesn't? This foreigner, this black slave, puts the Davidic king to shame because he trusts in the Lord of the ones he serves when they don't even do so themselves. This is the height of irony and of God's magnificent grace because even our failure in faith will not frustrate his grace. And he's called a eunuch. Now, it's possible that this is just a term for a high office. Potiphar himself, if you remember back to the account of Joseph in Genesis 39, verse 1, was called a eunuch. Although, if you look back there in your English translation, you'll probably find it translated more tamely as officer. Although, you know, with him being a eunuch, that might actually be part of the story. That's another time. But technically... A eunuch is a castrated male. Often a castrated male servant placed in charge of important tasks like especially being in charge of the king's harem, which you understand makes a castrated officer a plus. But this isn't something that males generally tend to volunteer for. And... It's a situation that keeps them away from the worship of God. Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 1 says this, and I'll put it out there, graphic content alert. All right, you look, that's the only guy left. All right, the rest of you guys are old enough. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. And yet, it's this castrated black slave who steps forward as the paragon of faith in close contrast to the king and receives the Lord's unambiguous welcome and well done. It's like what we read in Isaiah chapter 56. I'm going to read verses 3 to 5 there. God says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh say, Yahweh will surely separate me from his people. And let, let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Right? Get it? For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off, which he does right here. And not just for this one. We read about another Ethiopian eunuch in service to the throne, who embraces the faith and then carries the faith back to his homeland in Acts chapter 8. There is no one too far away from the grace of God. In fact, God sometimes uses those far away to shame those who are close. 
as he. Okay, that's who he is. Second, what he does. The king himself doesn't have the courage or the care, but he grants his brave, godly slaves request. Look at verse 10. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you from here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. Thirty men? I mean, it only take a few to pull them up and pull them out. The rest are evidently protection. And he needed it. And Ebed-Melech steps boldly forward and does what faith and faithfulness requires. He rescues God's servant, and he does so with evident care. Look at verses 11, following. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe in the storehouse and took from there old rags and worn out clothes which he let down to Jeremiah and the sister and by robes. Then Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah Drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the cart of the guard. I mean, he would need that padding to keep him from getting some serious rope burn at the very least. Being stuck as he is, you know how deep? In the muck. Sunk down in the muck. And Ebed Melech shows both godly courage and godly care. I would say this man is a wonderful example of a godly man for us all, is he not? Yes. And it's not that Ebed Melech isn't afraid. This is so important to notice. Yes. It's not that Ebed Melech isn't afraid. In fact, he actually is. God even states that in chapter 39, verse 17. He says, you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are. Afraid. Afraid certainly of the Babylonian armies, the onslaught that is about to so violently rush in, but also clearly afraid of the Judean officials whose sentence he is directly going against. They have delivered Jeremiah to this death, and even the king would not dare to oppose them openly, which again is why he needed those 30 men. So Evan Melech is afraid just like any of us would be as well. It's just that his fear is not what drives him. His fear is not what governs his life, his decisions and actions. Faith is. Trusting God is. As I've said it before, others have said it as well. Do it. Scared. Right? Don't let your fear stop you from doing what you know you need to do before God. Do it scared anyway. Like David confessed in Psalm 56 that we used as our call to worship, verse 3, when I am afraid. When I am afraid, I put my trust. And third, God rewards him for that. Look at verses 15 to 18 of chapter 39. The word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares Yahweh, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares Yahweh. You see, the Lord watches over his own. And whether we live or die, suffer or prosper, we are always in his eternal care. And we can rest in that and continue to courageously and compassionately act and speak as befits a servant of God. We live in increasingly unsettling with many things swirling around and sucking us down that we have cause to fear. Things at home and things abroad. Things in our culture and things in the church. And we can evaluate things and 
respond to things in one of two ways. We can look at the fear and be gripped by the fear. Or we can look at the fear, same thing, <laughs> and be gripped by faith. By our faith in the one who is above all these fears and must be above all these fears in our hearts and in our lives. So as we close, let me bring that opening question back. Which of these will be your driving force? Which force will govern your life? Will it be fear or will it be faith? Let it be faith. Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It's a word that uh, calls us into places we'd rather not go. But as you bring us there, we'll draw our eyes past the fears and towards you in faith and trust completely. Help us to act courageously and compassionately with wherever you have placed us to work out your righteousness, to, to image the, your character and your hope and your life, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Even as we lurch forward into the darkness more and more, let us be those shining lights in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I'd like to close with a song that, um, that I wrote out of the darkest and hardest period of my life. I bring it to you only because it is so apropos in the moment of where we've been in the Word of God today. It is, will I look to the Savior? I will. Please stand. Please join me if we enter in.
bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face towards you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. The grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. I know it's afternoon, so you're starving, Marvin's. We got lots for you right over here. Please join us for some fellowship and refreshments. Oh, it does. Okay. Okay.